We are we are in the book of John, chapter eleven, and uh, I'll tell you this up front: we're going to be I'll, we'll be gone the next two Sundays. We're leaving tomorrow. Um, going to Angel Fire with Amy and her kids. She didn't want to go by herself with the kids. To her, some her friends of hers have a cabin up there we're going to go to, and then. We're leaving there on Friday, headed north, and Becky has a doctor's appointment in Denver. She goes next year for three months for one doctor, for six months for a different one. We're going up there for her doctor's appointment. And then from there, going further north to visit her brother in Casper, Wyoming. She hasn't seen him in a, a good while, several years. So we're going to just make a trek of it. So be in prayer for us. Uh, lots of safe miles. For Amy tomorrow, we may be far by herself with the three kids. Yes, for Amy too, because <clears throat> Friday when we head north, she'll be headed home with the kids. So be in prayer, all right? So we're in John chapter 11. And uh, this is the story of Lazarus, which we will not cover all of it today because of time, but uh, most of you know the story of Lazarus, right? Lazarus dies, Jesus says, come forth, he walks out. There's a lot more to the story than that, that's why we can't get the whole thing today, all right? So, we're going to start off with the first, uh, I'm going to try to get through 27 verses of it, and that's still before he comes back to life, okay? Verses 1 and 2, chapter 11. Uh, the title of this message is, I Am the Resurrection. Before we start reading, let's go to the word prayer. Father, we humbly bow, we come before you. I ask you, Father, to speak through me, not my words, but yours. Let your words speak loudly to our hearts, our soul, and our mind. Let us learn from your word today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Verses 1 and 2, Now a certain man was ill. Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. Now, we'll get into the anointment part later, so just keep that in mind for a later date, okay? Before I go any further, I want to go backwards, so keep your spot there in John. Go backwards to the book of Luke. Chapter 10, verse 38. Now I want to get some more information about Martha and Mary, okay, before we continue on. Now, as they were on their way, Jesus entered a village, which would be Bethany. And a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. Some background on Martha and Mary. We're back in John, okay? But I want to say this about Martha and Mary. Martha is represented primarily as a rather determined worker. Martha is a determined worker. Mary is the worshipful one. She's at the Lord's feet. Hang on every word, worshiping Him. Alright? Now, every church has both of these. Every church has the worker, Martha, who says, Tell Mary to get in the kitchen and help me. Every church has the worshipful Mary who says, Martha, Martha, let's just praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Come on, Martha, Martha. Let's just lift our... Martha, no, Martha. Martha. Every church has the worker Martha and the worshipful Mary. 
We need to realize that if the worshipful Marys would help the, the uh, worker Martha's more, the worker Martha's might worship with the Marys more. There will always be work to do, much of which needs to be done. But we must take the time to worship. Every church has the worker Marthas. Every church has a worshipful Marys. And every church better had Jesus. It takes the worker Martha and the worshipful Mary to make the church work. Now this doesn't pertain just to women. It's men too, all right? But if the Marthas will worship more, the work will happen. But that doesn't mean that the Marys can ignore the work in and of the church. I've seen it all too often where you have the workers in there doing all the work, and the others may not be worshiping, but they're sitting around talking. There is a time for work, there is a time for worship, and we need to be mindful of both and respectful of both. Now, I'm going to say this. I praise God that my wife and I, have, we have not seen these contrasting attitudes in this church. It is very refreshing. Everybody jumps in to help when there's work to be done. Right? I can go back to the 4th of July. We all pitched in. Didn't work beforehand, didn't work at that time. Right? I can go back and get on the roof of this church and fix a leak. We had so many men show up to work. And then we can go to church and we're worshiping together. We don't have that division between the workers and the worshipers. It's very refreshing to see it blended. When it's time to work, we're going to work. When it's time to worship, we're going to worship. Amen. That's a refreshing thing. Everybody's willing and ready to step in and help, ready to step up and praise. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. Okay? We're going to learn more about Mary and Martha in chapter 12. Okay? Let's go to verse 3. So the sister sent to him, this being... Jesus, say, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Now, Jesus was close to Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, all right? As we saw in the book of Luke, they went to their home. They opened their home up. They cooked for Jesus and his disciples that followed him, right? They knew they would be welcome in that home, but Martha and Mary and, and Lazarus are also disciples of Jesus, learning from him. They were close to him. They were very, very good friends. Jesus, the one you love, is very sick. He is very sick, Jesus. You need to come. You need to come. He is very ill. These two sisters were concerned about their brother's welfare. So they send a message to Jesus and tell him, hey, please come. Please come. Look at verse 4. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not, does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were all followers of Jesus they learn from him, open their home to him and his disciples. But Jesus delayed in going to heal Lazarus. Does that sound like love? Does that sound like he's really close to him? Man, he is, he is gravely ill. Yep. Okay. Whatever. Is that the attitude you're catching here? You catch Jesus just going, yeah. See, I don't catch that attitude. Why? Because he said, so the Son of God may be glorified. What does death mean to Jesus, right? Verses 5 and 6. 
Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Going through, yeah, the six here. All right. So Jesus hears Lazarus is sick, and he says, he'll be all right. He'll be all right. I'm not going to worry about it. It's all good. You know, oftentimes it's what Christians do. When we hear this man needs prayer, it's all good. I'm not going to worry about it. It'll be all right. Do you ever, when somebody says, can you please pray for her? Put her name in here. How many times do you go, yeah, okay, and you walk away and you just totally forget about it? Is it not a better practice to sometimes be depend on where you are, sometimes it may not matter where you are? Man, my mom, she is really sick. Let's pray for your mom. Can I pray with you right now for your mom? That person will go, oh, hey, they're serious about their prayer. They're serious about their prayer. And when we pray, how do we pray? Do we pray, well, I lift up mom to you, and, and I'd like for her to be okay, but not my will but yours. You see, we get that prayer from Jesus in the, in the, in the garden when he's saying, Father, take this cup away from me. But Father, not my will but yours. And see, it's a whole different thing than when we're praying, well, we want to be healed. See, God's word says he wants to be healed. So we say, well, no, no, we'll, let's have God lead because Jesus said it. Pray his word. According to your word, Father, prayers are lifted up, and the prayer of faith will heal the sick. Right? Do we pray in faith? Do we pray in faith? Jesus said, why? So the Son of God may be glorified. 7 and 8. Then after this, he said to his, to his disciples... Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews are just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? You remember chapter 10? They wanted to stone him again? This is a recurring thing. And the disciples say, Wait a minute, Rabbi, teacher, they, they just tried to kill you there. And they're going to go back again? Jesus was determined. Jesus had his reason for going back. He wasn't afraid of death. He knew his time wasn't yet. Right? Verses 9 and 10, Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day... If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Now, is Jesus simply talking about night and day? It's hard to get stuff done at nighttime because you can't see what you're about to trip, trip over. In daytime, you can see it, and maybe you won't trip over. Is that all he's talking about here? As, as, as we have learned in John, it's very rarely just what he's talking about. He's always getting down deeper. Always getting down deeper. Jesus, he goes into a, 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 a sermonette. Okay? A small sermon. He goes back into the light and the darkness like he did during the festival of tabernacles. Where he talked about being the light of the world. Jesus reminded his disciples that the light enables them to see. And that those who do not have the light in them were in danger of stumbling spiritually. You're not talking physically. Jesus was saying in his sermon that the disciples needed to deal with their spiritual condition of darkness. They do this by relying on the presence in their midst, the light, which is Jesus. That's what he means here. That's what he's saying. Verses 11 through 16. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. 
The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will, he, he will recover. Now, Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them, what's this word, plainly, Lazarus has died. Oh, now we get it. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. They just said, Hey, they're trying to stone you there. They're going to kill you. And if you go back, they're probably going to succeed this time. So you know what? Let's all go. Not one of them said, um, you know what? Uh, call us when you get there. We'll, we'll go a different route, and we'll meet you there, honest. We will. No, they said, come on, let's go. He's going to die, and we're going to die right beside him. That was a great sentiment. We know later on in the garden it didn't happen that way. Right? Now, think about this. It's very possible that by the time the message reached Jesus, Lazarus could have already been dead. Because of the fact he was that sick and it took time to get the message to Jesus. He could have been dead already. Jesus delays two, two days and then he says, let's go. And by the time they get there, he'd been dead how long? We're going to bring it in a minute. Four days. There's a reason for this. Alright? I want you to see this. Jesus had to speak plainly to them. Lazarus is dead. He had to speak plainly to them. He said Lazarus had fallen asleep, meaning he had died. They heard he's taking a nap. Side note. Ladies, we don't get hints. If, if Jesus couldn't get a hint across to his disciples, what makes you think you get a hint across to us? Side note, just speak plainly. Ready yet? Write a note. Right? 17 through 22. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. They did not laid state. They did not embalm people and the third day bury them. They did not have a funeral lady go by and you can view. They didn't have that technology. When they died, they wrapped them up. They put spices in the wrapping. They put spices on the wrapping when they put them in the tomb. Why? Two reasons. One, to control odor. Two, to help the decaying process take place. Why? Later they go back in, they take the bones, put them in a small box, and have that place for somebody else to lay. When we were in Israel, we got to see a tomb. We also got to see a different place, a place that had all these boxes that had bones in them. Some were broken and open. They had been there for a long time. You couldn't get to them. You could see them. And that's what they do, right? That's what they did then. They would, they would lay and they would decompose. And then they would take the bones and put them in a small box, take up less room. You're in the good old U.S. of A. We don't do that. We don't go dig up from a box and say, "All right, down the bones, pick them up, have them all for somebody else." But they did then. They dug the tomb by hand, and oftentimes they had more than one place to lay a body in the tomb. Okay, Jesus was laid in a brand new tomb, had never been used before. Okay, remember that. Alright, been in the tomb for four days. 18. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. 
So when Martha heard Jesus was coming, she went and met him. This is the worker Martha. Remember this. And Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Martha had work to do in meeting Jesus. She had an agenda. If you had been here, you wouldn't have died. But you're here now. You ask God, and God will do whatever you ask Him to do, so do it. Whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Lazarus had been dead four days. All right? This notation is very important. Okay? Those that are familiar with the Jewish burial customs, the general belief was that the spirit of the deceased hovered around the body for three days. Okay, listen to this. In anticipation that some possible means of re-entry into the body could happen. So they believe the spirit hovered around the body for three days. But on the third day, it was believed that the body lost its color and the spirit was locked out of the body. Therefore, the spirit was obligated to enter the chambers of Shul which is the place of the dead. The passing of the third day, therefore, signified the conclusion of the last hope for the mourners. <coughs> Lazarus was dead four days. As long was Jesus in the tomb? Three. Okay. Now, the fact that a number of people had come out at the passing of Lazarus tells us he was probably well-loved, maybe even a, a, an important man. The Bible doesn't tell us one way, but people from Jerusalem had come out to Bethany and they heard Lazarus had died, and they came out to mourn with the sisters as a common thing for days. Okay? So the mourners were there when Jesus comes and Martha trots out of the house and goes to him. The mourners are there. They are mourning. What do we do here? We take food. We mourn best on a full belly. It's Texas, what can I say? The mourners would stay for days mourning. And if the person could afford it or wanted to, they could hire professional mourners. They would get, they, they'd, they'd just get carried away. Okay. But these are friends of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And they are actually grieving with them. They're not doing it for show. It's from the heart. Okay? So the fact that they were there meant he might have been a person of some influence. Now, as I said, worker Martha jumps up and she goes to Jesus because she had some work to do for him. Right? If you had been here, but now that you are, 23 through 27. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha was well trained. She knew. Okay. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? This is used at funerals. I use this Friday morning at a memorial service. Okay? 27, she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Jesus tells her that her brother will rise again. And she wants some clarification. She wants some clarification on this. 
And then Jesus bypasses all understanding that she had of who he is and what his real power really was, the power that he possessed. He bypassed all this. He tells her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And he says, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Do you remember what I said earlier, John, about I am? The I am. Jesus is the I am. Right? He says here, I am. And the rest of what follows in this statement of who he is, is about who he is and who his power, what his power is. It is not talking about Jesus rising from the dead when he says, I am the resurrection and life. Jesus isn't talking about himself rising from the dead. He's not talking about, he's talking about the power given him by his Father God. He is resurrection and life. Jesus is resurrection and life. He didn't just resurrect and come back to life. Jesus is resurrection and life. And if we believe in him, if we believe on him, I mean really believe, not just saying that, yeah, I believe he's God's son and all that other good stuff. Let me tell you something. We've got to put our faith and our trust in him and on him. He will take away our sins if we ask him. And we will not see spiritual death, which is eternity in hell. When we experience true spiritual resurrection in Jesus, we will have life eternal in heaven with him. That's why Jesus said, whoever believes in me puts their faith and trust in him. Though he die physically, yet he will yet Yet shall he live spiritually, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die spiritually. We have all seen people who have died. We've been to funerals. We've seen the deceased. Many of us have sat with people while they died. I have, I can't even tell you many times. I've watched people take their last breath. We all understand that humans die. Anybody disagree? Humans die. We all understand this. But spiritually, we will last eternally. We, are, we have eternity ahead of us, heaven or hell. We will last an eternity in heaven if we ask Jesus to forgive us of our sin, commit our lives to him, or in hell if we don't. It's simple. You see, getting saved isn't just getting some fire insurance. Some people think if they say a cute prayer, they won't go to hell. But getting saved means turning your whole life over to Jesus. That doesn't mean everybody who does is going to get sent to Africa or have to pastor a church. Those are callings. But we are known by our fruit. And I believe that as Christians, we should be producing good fruit. You judge a tree by its fruit. I used to be in the tree business. I worked on a lot of fruit trees. Man, my tree just sick. It just, it just oh, the fruit looks terrible. Well, okay, we need to do several things to your to your tree to make it better. One, I need to prune this tree when the season's right to take some load off of it. Two, I need to feed this tree. Three, right now we need to spray this tree. you got bugs on it. We need to do several things to improve the health of your tree. And so the person would judge their tree by the fruit they were or were not getting. Right? As a Christian, the world judges us by our fruit. I believe that true Christians should be living their life in such a manner that other people want to know what the difference is. 
I believe that true Christians should be willing to share their faith, should be willing to share their salvation experience with others. You see, 99% of the people in this world, they don't want to hear some practiced way of sharing Jesus. They want to hear you share your experience. Why? Because that's real. I was taught to use the Roman road. Go through the book of Romans. You can use verses in Romans. I have butchered that so many times, it wouldn't be funny. I learned to share Jesus without fear, which is a very effective way. Let me tell you, it comes down to, folks want to know, is it real to you? And you share your salvation experience, it's real. That's real. I think all too often people get confused between the aspects of, of church and salvation. If we are saved, we should want to be in church with other believers. We are his sheep as that lone sheep gets eaten by the wolf. So we should want to be with the flock where there's protection, where there's power, right? We can worship together. Let me tell you something. You're worshiping with worshipers and inspires worship. When you're studying and learning with other believers, it inspires study and learning. Too many people think that they're a member of a church. I'm okay. My name's on the road of that church. I'm going to heaven. Let me tell you something. Church membership can't save you. Cannot save you. I believe too many churches today are missing the mark because they've allowed everybody they can to come in and be a member of their church. And I believe that we should ask people enough pointed questions that we should at least have a pretty good idea of where they are with Christ. I've been to churches where they would question somebody's baptism, but not their salvation. That's backwards. We should know by talking to them if they're saved or not. Well, tell me, when did you get saved? Tell me your story. Oh, well, you know, uh, mom went to church, and uh, so I did, so here I am. That's a good start. We should know. We should ask them enough pointed questions to know where they are with Christ. I know we can't know their heart. Jesus does. We should be able to find out pretty close where they are. I think way too many churches have been compromised because people have been let in that are not saved and then they start making decisions for the church and then the church becomes watered down and ineffective. We need to be an effective church. We need to be on fire for Jesus. Fires attract attention. You don't believe me? Set your house on fire. You're going to get attention. Yeah. You have those folks going, well, look at that house on fire. Those going, hey, uh, there's a house on fire over here. Where are you at? Well, close to my house. Well, where's your house? You know, where I live. You got a fire department paying lots of attention to you. If we as a church Members, if we as believers are on fire, we will attract attention. We will attract attention. We need to be an effective church. When a church is not effective, they're no more than a social club. We must do all we can to be the church and to make sure that our church is Christ-centered. Following Christ Doing His will, His way. What does that mean? I've seen a lot of people try to do the will of Christ the way they want it done. When we do the will of Christ His way, things happen. Good things happen. Jesus asked Martha if she believed what He said. And she replied, Yes, Lord. I believe. Yes, Lord. I believe. I want to ask you this morning, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Do we believe that He is the Christ, 
the Son of God? Let me tell you a secret. Demons believe he is the Christ, the Son of God. Matter of fact, they know for a fact he is the Christ and the Son of God, but they won't be in heaven. They will not be in heaven. We must believe he is the Christ and make him Lord of our life. We do that if we've never been saved as Jesus to forgive us of our sin. And then we live for him. Or if we've been saved for 50 years and we're just kind of floating along, maybe we need to get a, a whole new commitment. Maybe we just say, Father, forgive me for not being serious about you and being on fire. Set me on fire. Send your Holy Spirit to flood my life from inside out, outside in, so I splash on everybody I get close to. Man, Father, just set me on fire. Fill me up. Man, we must believe He is the Christ and make Him Lord of our life. Now, I want to ask you today, have you done this? Have you done this, believer? Reminded of a song this morning. You might have heard it. What can wash away my sin? Nothing, Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. And here's the fact. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but his blood can wash us. Nothing. There's no other way to get to God's heaven in God's way, and that is His Son. No other way. Invitation this morning, I want to ask you, have you believed this? Do you believe? Can you say, yes, Lord, I believe with your whole heart? We're going to pray. The invitation, man, let's get serious about God. Father, we come to you. We pray.